Hello everyone and welcome back to another tutorial. My name is Philip and today we're going to be finalizing the topic of Fog of War. This time, however, we are not going to be working with physics. And also there are some improvements here that are going to be showing you. Stuff that was behind the scenes on the previous tutorial all not that great. But now it should be pretty good. So hopefully you can watch this video and update your Fog of War as well. So this is how you can build a fog of war system without using physics. This is the fully approach and should be a little better than on my previous version. So fog of war is fog that you see on here on the map that gets explored. It starts to dissolve and as it starts showing objects as they are visible behind the fog, we start displaying them. Otherwise we keep it hidden. But notice this meal here that whenever we starts locking it off it's going to keep the buildings as they are and sometimes even create a dummy object so as you can see here you can see that the mesh here changes to something else and usually that is done to improve graphical performance so you can see here on top of the mule here's another example we have a flag uh, that whenever we step out, whenever the building is outside the fog of war, it stays hidden. And all of these are performance optimizations because this is probably a cloth simulation that's happening here, a very simple one. So there's a lot of different ways we can apply fog of war. This is how Age of Empires does it. So here we are on another game and this is Star Wars Galactic Battlegrounds. And as you can see here, the Fog of War almost follow the same principles here. Units, whenever they are inside of the Fog of War, they get to get displayed if they are not your allies or your own units. And with buildings, whenever they are hidden on the Fog of War, they get mixed in with the Fog of War. Which in this case, because it's, it is a 2D game, it's a little more easier to do than the 3D game. But the concept is still the same, we can set it up with a shader. And the buildings get displayed whenever a corner of their placement gets detected inside of the Fog of War. So with units you can use the center of the coordinates for the object to display or hide it. But with buildings we have to calculate their corners. And one of the ways we can do that very easily in 3D is, as you have guessed it, what we used on the previous tutorial, the AABB of a 3D mesh object. So we can use that to detect whenever a corner point of a building is inside or outside of the fog war system. This is just another example of how the fog of war can be applied inside the game. So let's jump into another game that you probably don't have guessed that also uses fog of war. So this is Fallout New Vegas and we are going to be seeing how they also implement a Fog of War system. So if you open your Pip-Boy here and you go towards, I believe it's local map, you can see here we have a Fog of War system to inside of Fallout New Vegas. So if you start moving and you check on their local map, you can see that we have the same concept applied here, we have a fog of war system applied for the local map, which is a common situation you want fog of war. So as I'm start moving here, we're going to be seeing that the local map fog of war system is going to be dissolving and display the places where we walked in and out. So as you can see, it's another game on a completely different genre that is also using a fog of war system. It's not specifically drawn towards strategy games, you can apply it to whatever you want that uses it, so top-down games, racing games for maps, etc. And this here is my project for the RTS game that I'm building. And as you can see, this is the Fog of War system that I'm using to create this here. So this is a sprite that I'm placing on top of the viewport camera here, so we can see what the texture looks like. So the idea of the Fog of War system is that we will be dissolving a second texture that will be generated inside the game, which is this black square here. Whenever units are inside the fog of war system, they are going to get displayed. And as you can see, it's not on real time, it's based on a delayed operation, so we can save some frames per second here. And I also have a build in here, these are debug points, so these are just sprites that I'm using to debug the AAB of this building, so this is going to represent a building. So with units, whenever we touch its object center, we are going to calculate if we should display it or not. With buildings, it's different. It's whenever you touch a corner point of the building. So as you can see, that is what it looks like. 
Whenever we are close to the building, I am modulating its shader colors. So from the center of the building, I am grabbing the its color pixel points here on the texture and using it inside the shader to modulate the appearance of the building. So it fades towards black or stays bright if you, units are near it. So if I select a bunch of units here and let me just rework my formation here. So if I have a bunch of units, you're going to see that the building stays pretty much 100% visible. And whenever we start to move away, it's going to fade towards gray a little bit and it's going to stay hidden. And my idea for this project is whenever buildings are outside of the fog of war zone, we are going to replace the model with a dummy object on top of it. So if you want to have any buildings with animations, my idea is to also disable the animations to improve performance by placing on top a static mesh object to represent where the building is. So I'm going to be displaying to you how you can do that inside Gideo. So the first thing for you to understand is that the Fog of War is a Fog of War generated texture inside a application that we keep dissolving using units or buildings or other events inside of the game. And we can combine that with anything we want in 2D games, it's against the camera. On the case of my 3D project, I combine it as a part of the terrain texture. So I get a dissolving fog that we're going to be used to display the game. So the idea is for each single unit to hold a sprite that follows it. And this sprite needs to be transparent because the alpha will be used to dissolve the generated fog of war texture. So the transparent parts of this sprite is going to be used to dissolve the texture later. So that's the idea with the fog of war. We add a fog of war dissolve sprite to be following each unit in the game that is allied or a own unit of the player. So inside the viewport, we get to dissolve them to build our fog of war generated texture to be used as part of the terrain texture or in the case of the 2D game as part of the camera. So how is the fog of war actually being built? So I have two passes. So I have a system where I'm going to use two passes to build this. So the fog of war is a blank texture that is created and later dissolved by own units allied and also temporary events inside your game. So something like enemy attacks, captures, etc. We want to build a temporary object that's going to use the same sprite that we use for units to dissolve that part of the map for a given duration in case of any special events. Fog of War system here is actually being built with two passes. So the first pass, I'm going to first get a combined version of all of those sprites by using the viewport as a texture. So I want to keep storing the Fog of War dissolved sprites inside a sprite for the viewport. So what I have here on my RTS Fog of War sprite texture control inside its viewport, which is called sub viewport inside Gideo. If you come here, you can see that sub viewport inherits from viewport. That is how you can use an interface to use the viewport system. So inside of that viewport that I'm going to be creating and building my RTS Fog of War texture, I have a sprite that is going to be on the background for this viewport. So the background is going to be storing all the dissolved Fog of War for all the units. So what I'm going to have is inside of this tree node, I'm going to have a list of sprites that is going to follow each single unit in the game that I want to be dissolving my Fog of War texture sprites. And this sprite is going to be assigned the first pass of the Fog of War, which is the combined dissolved sprites that are 100% bright because I'm going to be changing the sprite modulation to store the second pass later. So the idea for us is to keep storing this dissolved section towards the, the first sprite. So after we have dissolved by combining the units fog of war system, so we're going to have this image here, we're going to be combining and dissolving the black texture with this. And then we're going to have the dissolved texture, which we're going to be assigned back to the frame texture as the first pass result. So we're going to have the dissolved texture on the background, while still we have sprites inside on top of it due to the viewport. So the idea here is that after the first pass, we're going to be darkening this sprite for this Fog of War texture. So we're going to be using this as the semi-explored areas for the Fog of War system. And on the final texture, once we export after the second pass has happened, we're going to have this combined texture here, which is actually the resulting Fog of War texture that will be applying on the terrain. So we're going to have 
all of the fog of war combined previously on the first pass that is going to be stored for each single frame the dissolved parts as 100% brightness being darkened so it can display it as semi-explored areas. And because our viewport also has all of those sprite dissolving sprites that we were using for the units in real time, once we export the texture again from the viewport, we'll be having the final fog of war system texture that we can apply inside of our terrains. So that is the idea. So it's a little bit complex, but I think you got the idea of how that works. We basically use the dissolved combined texture layers to be the semi-explored layers later once the final texture has been exported. We exported it at first, just after we combined all the fog of war dissolved textures. And this step keeps happening again and again. And whenever we are redoing the fog of war update, before we dissolve it again, we need to set it back from the darkened to be the semi-explore areas back to 100%. So we can keep adding more dissolved areas for the units and we keep displaying it. So this step here was basically what I built, having the, that idea inside my head that I want to have an expanding area that is growing with dissolved units. And then later, I also want an active area when they're dissolving units. So that is how I built it. So you can build this on different ways. And this is actually generated two texture per fog of war update. So it's not the best system, but it gets the job done. So you can do all of this inside a shader. But for simplicity's sake, I think that this is simpler for you to execute inside your own project because everything here is happening inside a viewport controller node. So all you have to worry about is just how you build the system structure and everything should take care of its own. So if you wanted to do this through shaders, you're going to have the same concept to be applied inside a shader by generating some kind of dissolve parameter towards a black texture per unit. And so you're going to be probably need to feed the shader with inputs of where units are so you can execute the code. So I think this system is simpler and uses the tools that we have from the engine a little easier. So it's also easier for you to understand it, which is basically using viewports as to generate this type of texture, which is a pretty common thing to do, in my opinion. So this is a good solution. And while this may be a little complicated at first, it is not that complicated. It's just a summary of different ideas me applied here together. So let's continue this and I'm going to be jumping now towards getting the unit 3D position to be the 2D texture. So one of the challenges we're going to have is because this is a 3D game, we need to match the 3D position from objects towards the fog of war texture. And this could be a challenge because the texture we want to be independently from the map size. We do not want to link because let's say you want a more high resolution fog of war texture you're going to be probably building and giving a specific dimension for that and this texture should match the map terrain texture later the size of it but we do not want the same size to be applied so we need to calculate it so the rules are that we need to match the 2d fog of war texture to the 3d terrain world match and this also requires us to match the units 3d position to the fog of war sprites in 2d so the question is, how do you going to match the two coordinate systems together? Because 3D is measuring meters and 2D is measuring pixels. So one in 3D represents one meter and one in 2D represents one pixel. And there's quite a difference there. So one of the ways you can do that is by grabbing the 3D map size as a vector two from top down. So you're going to grab the X and Z from the map AAB size and convert it to a vector two with X and Y. So we can use it with the fog of war texture size, which is already a vector two. So the ratio difference we are going to use is going to be what is going to calculate the difference between these two. There's going to be used for coordinate system and also to scale the fog of war texture. And this is the code that does that. So we are going to have a variable here, which is a float. And because our variables here are integers, we need to convert them to float. So we can grab the remainder decimals, otherwise this function is going to fail and it's going to return integer values converted to float later. So the idea for you is to have the decimated values, we need to convert them to float here. So this is the 2D size, which is simply the new terrain texture size dot x. So the new texture size you're going to define whenever you generate the new blank texture. So you want 
a 512 by 512, 256, etc. So we're going to pass a size to be used as a new texture size for the fog of war system. But we also want to grab the map size. Now, because my map is a squared and not rectangular, if you want to build rectangular maps, etc., you're going to probably change this code quite a bit. But the concept is still the same. You just have to create what is going to be the world ratio for the difference between these two texture sizes. So here I'm just grabbing the map size x value to be used as from the 3D size to be converted as the fog of war ratio. So now let's see how are you going to be applying the fog of war system as part of the terrain shader. So we are going to have our terrain mesh that is going to have the diffuse shader, which basically is going to have only a diffuse map inside of it to be the terrain. And we want to get the fog of war texture applied to the terrain. So this will be what it's going to look like. We're going to have a black and white texture that is going to basically be multiplied later. And what happens when you multiply this fog of war texture for your diffuse map is you're going to get the fog of war system represented in 3D. So this is what it's going to look like whenever you multiply your fog of war texture inside your shader with the diffuse materials with that. So this is what it's going to look like. We're going to have a unit here which, if you calculate everything correctly, it should be on the spots where you could see the Fog of War system. So that is the main gist of how you can apply the Fog of War Terrain Shader. Now let's talk about the viewports to terrain workflow that we are using. So we're going to have a viewport in 2D that is going to represent the map radius extension. So what we're going to do is to position this viewport on the middle of the map. Because the viewport is built from top down left, you usually have to center it. But if you have a camera in the 2D coordinate system that is centered, you're not going to face that problem. And all that is required is for your 3D world to also be centered around it. Also with this new workflow, we can use the UV ones to project the fog of our texture on top of the terrain. So the idea with this here is also using the UV coordinate system from the mesh. So with the previous workflow, because we built the terrain with similar individual copies, we could not use the UV1 coordinates because it was used to texture the terrain pieces. But because with this workflow, each single square region of the terrain is unique, so can use LOD calculations to simplify the mesh whenever the camera is far away from them, we can use the UV1. And for that, it is required for you to project your UV maps from Blender using the top-down projection which I believe I did the same thing on the previous tutorial, but using UV2, because you can store two UV maps inside the mesh and Gudo allows you to import it because it uses also to, if I believe, to bake lighting inside your objects, inside materials. So it also benefits from UV2 for other things. So for that, I was using to apply the fog of on top of duplicated instance. But in this case, it should be unique meshes. So for you, you can use UV1 just as fine. So that is the idea of how we can apply that. And the rule here for this to work is that the viewport will be centered on the 2D coordinate system by using a center camera. Now your 3D mesh also needs to be centered around the origin of the world. So these two anchor points will be used together to calculate the coordinate system for the remaining of the units. So later you can use the terrain mesh to combine it with the fog of war texture. So we are going to simply apply the fog of our texture as a multiply factor on top of the terrain. And this will be the last remaining thing that you're going to do to apply the texture on top of your terrain. Because the UV coordinates are from 0 to 1 and it matches the top down projection of the terrain, our texture is also going to be working with 0 to 1. So that is why it is required for you to have a center coordinate system to be at 0 so it can match those two. And for you to match the scale texture with the terrain dimensions, all you need to do is just multiply the size of the texture by this value here, which is going to be our world to FOV ratio, which is this calculation here. And this will also be used to scale coordinates of the objects in the 3D space back to 2D. So that is what it's going to look like. So that is how you're going to be converted a 3D coordinate system back to 2D to be used as a texture. Now there's another problem here that you're going to face, which is about hiding or showing objects. So our fog of our system to work properly, we'll need to hide and display units whenever they are outside or inside the fog of our texture. 
So the first question we're going to be asking is, what will be the method that is going to hide objects? So not detecting whether they are inside or outside of the fog of war, how we are going to hide them. So there are some solutions that have come up to mind as ideas and also some solutions that is built in with the engine. We're going to have a shader discard, which is going to discard rendering the shader on the fragment code. We're going to also be trying transparent material to see how the performance works with that. I also had some idea with the vertex shrinker, which basically is to take our vertex points and scale them to zero infinity. So as a method to hide your object. And we also have the option of hiding the visibility of your 3D objects, just like acting with the notifier inside Godot in the Spectre. So the first solution was trying the discard fragment and light functions. So that was the worst solution that I found out of these four here, because despite it not actually rendering the fragment code, it is still using the vertex calculations for the pixels. And per, as the documentation says here, it means that a shader that uses this card on all of this pixel is still more expensive to render compared to not rendering any object in the first place. So while we are discarding parts of the fragment code, we are still rendering some other stuff behind the scenes. So it is more expensive than to not render a object. So this was the worst solution that I found out of these four. Next one was transparent material, which basically you enter your fragment shader and set your alpha property to zero. This shouldn't turn your material as transparent. And you also have to enable the alpha transparency method but this is how you can turn a material to be transparent. So as I've tested, this was somewhat slower, not ideal as well, but it was better than the discard option. The next one was the vertex shrinker. So I have the idea of scaling all the vertex back to zero infinity so we could hide the object and possibly not have the performance cost. And that remained an idea because <laughs> I did not found a way to implement that. So I decided to switch to another solution while I figured that out. So I did not could implement that, but it remains an idea for to be tested later whenever I have time to research about it and find a way to do it. Now, funny enough, the best performance method was actually the easiest to do. So hiding the visibility of any 3D object was actually the most performant and fastest method. So just by talking the visibility of your 3D object, there's code that is happening behind the scenes that is also preventing the object to be rendered inside Gideon. So while if you have scripts running and stuff like that, it's going to be running in the background, but on the rendering side, it's going to be the fastest way. So all of these four methods, I found that hiding the visibility using the visibility property of your 3D objects is the fastest method. And I have done some benchmarks to test this. So the easiest way for you to hide objects that are not inside the fog of war is to just hide this visibility. It was the fastest method and is also the easiest. It should be pretty simple to code. So now let's come to the last problem we're going to face. How we are going to detect if the a 3D object, so you have the method to hide it, which is basically to turn its visibility off. Now how you determine if an object is inside or outside of the fog of war system. So you have this viewport texture, which represents the fog of war texture finalized. How you define if it's visible or not. So this will be a visibility detection method. So is what is defining if it's visible or not is just by getting the pixel color from the object position inside the fog of war texture. So if we say that its pixel color is higher than 0.5, its value, which you can interpret as its brightness, can say that is visible. So that is pretty much how I am doing it. I'm detecting the object and from that position I check if its pixel color value is higher than 0.5. And if it is true, then I know this object should be visible inside the game. So the way that this is benefits us is because buildings will need to be calculated different. So whenever they are outside of the zone, so let's say an object is on the point here, if the pixel color is less than 0.5, I can determine that the object is no longer inside a relevant fog of war and it's completely hidden. So I have some options here. So if this is an unit and it's not owned or it is an ally unit, we can hide it using the toggle visibility method here. But if it's a building, we have some options here. 
So I have the option to keep the building with the same color. That will be the fastest method. But I also can change an instance color inside that object and modulate it to that exact same position of the pixel. So it does not hide it permanently, but it can be used as a darkened version, a dummy version of that building. You can also use it later for to build to replace that 3D mesh with a simpler dummy object that does not have animations and has a lot of simpler geometry. So the idea with this is to improve performance. You, whenever you step outside of those fog of war zones that are on the semi-explore area, so outside of the active zones. We want buildings to have a lower and simplified geometry without animations and we also use their center pixel color to be modulate their shader. So we can change the visibility of the object to be a little darker gray, so just like other RTS games does, to improve the look aesthetics of the game to show that that object is no longer in inside the Fog of War active range. So that is the solution that I found for that. And if you plan to do buildings with animations, let's say a factor, or even the case of Age of Empires, like the Mew is saw there, we could disable those animations and just leave a basic building there, which should work fine in most cases. And also for the visibility detection method, I could have used some other type of calculation like distance calculations. So with distance, you usually grab the fog of war range of the units as a object parameter and calculate if it's inside or outside. But the downside of this is that you're going to have to calculate for every single unit in the game that has an active ring of fog of war. But because of the aesthetics that I wanted to hide buildings partially, I need to have this modulation, so I decided to use the pixel color from the viewport. And from my simple tests, it seems to have enough performance to be used as we want, so I'm going to be using it, the pixel color instead of calculating distance. So all of that should take care for you to build the RTS Fog of War system. And I'm going to be showing you snippets of code of how this is being done inside Gitio. I think it's better than the last iterations that I did. This does not use physics calculations or area calculations whatsoever. So now we're back here on Gitio. So my object that deals with the fog of war texture is our sub viewport here. We have a camera. We have the fog of our texture, which is a simple sprite 2D that is centered on the viewport. That is also going to be used to compile all the fog of our explore areas. So we can use that later as semi explore areas. So we are rendering the fog of war in two passes. We have here a fog of war units 2D node that is simply going to hold all the other sprites we're going to use to dissolve the fog of our texture itself. So this is going to gener be generated with a list of sprites from the three. 3D objects from the 3D scene. And also we have here a fog of war camera that is going to be anchored on its center. That is also centered on the viewport. So on the 2D coordinates is on zero here. So it can apply on top of our terrain. And the important part here is for you to make sure that your anchor mode is set to drag center and that on your 3D mesh on your terrain, you're going to want your terrain to be centered on the world origin, otherwise this is not going to work. You're going to need to match the 2D top-down coordinates from the 3D mesh terrain that you have here to a top-down coordinate system that we're going to create from the fog of our texture, which is going to look almost like this. So then we can scale that texture back to the terrain and we should be able to apply that on top. So as you saw, we can use the pixel color from the fog of our texture to see if objects are hidden or displayed. So the code for my fog of our texture generator is this one. So it's pretty simple. We have here some nodes. I have saved here some shortcuts variable because whenever you retrieve an image, it most likely is going to create a copy of that. So I'm going to simply store the update image inside of this object so I can later grab it from the RTS world to be used on the terrain later. So whenever we want to generate a new texture for our fog of our system, we're going to simply ask for a size, which is going to be a vector 2i. So it's a vector 2 integer and we're going to change our viewport size. So this is important. We want the viewport size to match our texture size. And we are going to be creating a new image which holds the same size and also is going to hold a format here. So then we're going to generate and create the texture which we're going to do. So this is the black, black square. 
So this is the first step, which is generating the black square texture for us to be used. So that is how we create that, which is a new image texture. So this is going to be called whenever our RTS world starts. Then next, we want to see how we are going to be updating the texture. So this is the code that is going to be running on a loop on our RTS map world to rebuild the fog of war to update all the units. So the units itself are not being updated inside of this object. That is the responsibility of the RTS map world. So what I'm doing here is simply running a code here that is going to run a render for the fog of war. I'm going to get that in just a second. I want to update the fog of our texture variable that I'm holding here to store the latest version of the viewport texture for the fog of war. So I'm doing that by creating an image texture from the fog of war viewport get texture dot get image. Then later I'm going to await for a signal which is the dissolve finished, which is going to come from the fog of war render tab here, which is going to basically ask for us whenever we finish rendering the fog of war. I want to emit a signal that our fog of war has been updated. So this is the signal that is going to be used for us to render back to the RTS map world to update the terrain and stuff. So that is very important for us. So the way that I'm rendering the fog of war through this function here, it executed two passes. So the first pass, we want to have the maximum amount of brightness. So if you go back here to my passes example, you can see that I, on the first pass, want everything to be 100% bright. So on the next dissolve, everything looks okay. Then later I'm going to darken that back down to be the fog of our semi-explorer areas. So that is what I'm doing here. Then I'm waiting for the viewport to update audience information by waiting for the render server for a post draw. Then later I'm going to bake that image together. So I'm going to basically combine all the units dissolved sprites with also the previous frame and dissolved sprites. So the area keeps growing with dissolved areas. And this is the dissolve function, which is the blend rect. And it's going to need first the image source. So it's the combined sprites image that we're going to be creating. So here I'm actually dissolving the bug of our image, which I'm stored right there. So that is the black rectangle texture created on the new Fog of War. And I'm going to be blending that against the combined version with all the dissolved unit sprites Fog of War. So that's how I, you do it. So that is the image source. Next is going to ask us for a size source. So I'm just grabbing the texture with it. It's get use rectangle to grab the size. And later it's going to ask us for a distance. So we are simply passing here vector to I0 because that is the same size of our combined vector, so we don't need to change that. Then later I'm going to update the background sprite that is this guy here to hold the latest version of that baked fog of war. So it can continue being rendered on the first pass and so forth. So then later I'm going to reduce the modulation of that sprite to now become the semi-explored fog of war. And after everything has been done, I'm going to emit the solve finished. So on this fog of war texture update here, it's going to relieve us from this signal. And we're going to finally say that we finished updating the fog of war, which is going to be used by another external control. So this is everything that it's doing. Now on the, on the side of the RTS 3D world, there are a couple of things here that is happening. So this is getting a little complex. So I'm sorry if this is going to be hard for you to understand because this is a continuation from the region's code. But hopefully I will try to explain my best here so you can understand it. So whenever we are on the ready process here, I creating the regions and stuff, I initializing the fog of war right here. So what happens when we initialize the fog of war? I am basically first grabbing and creating the words to fog of war texture scale ratio which if you saw here on my explanation here, that is basically the new texture size for the fog of war divided by the map size. So the map size I'm going to be grabbing from created the regions from the previous videos. So this is basically the width of the map. So the complete size of the map and because it's a square and only using one side. So that is why I'm using X there. Then I'm going to be accessing the fog of war texture object and it's going to be asking a new fog of war texture to be generated. And this should only be run once. So the, the parameter that is going to pass here is going to be the size for the fog of our texture. 
So if you want more or less resolution, this is the place that you're going to set it up. Whenever you generate the new image texture, you want to pass a size. So depending on performance and how your graphics for the game is going to look, you're going to change this size here. So I could show you what that looks like. So I'm going to leave what I have here, which is 128 by 128. So the sprite you are seeing here on the screen is a sprite that I placed on the tree node for the RTS map world just to debug the fog of war. So it's just a sprite on top of everything else that I'm putting down here on the corner. And I'm assigning the texture for this sprite to be the fog of war rendered image. So I can see what is actually happening with the fog of war texture. Here you can see how it's being applied to the terrain. And we have actually code that is hiding the objects, which is going to show you how that works. But as you can see here, whenever we start moving, we can see that the fog of war is being rendered and it's being dissolved. And if you remember on the first pass, I'm accumulating and keeping the dissolved fog of war texture. So let me just zoom that out a bit. You can see this gray area here, which represents the first pass of a fog of war. So if I go back here to my presentation, this is the point where we want it. So on the final image, I want to modulate it back to gray. But on the first pass, I want to keep combining it back and keeping it at 100% brightness. So we keep adding more and more fog of war dissolved. And that is happening here, as you can see right there. We are moving our units and we keep getting new texture every, every few seconds. So we can keep growing the areas. And this is space here, which is gray. It was actually fully bright. We modulated back to be a little darker so we can represent the semi-explored areas. And the active areas is just a bunch of sprites that are following our objects. So there's no extra code involved in that. They are always active and they are always captured by the viewport because they are always following the objects. So you can see what that looks like. So this is how the fog of war is working behind the scenes there. So what I wanted to show you is by changing the resolution here, going to see what that looks like inside the game. So I don't know if this is going to change the size of my sprite. I believe it's going to look a little smaller. But let's see what it does. Yeah, so as you can see, I have to scale it a little bit so you can see it better. As you can see here, the fog of war texture for this map now, it's a lot smaller. And as you can see, the effect it has on the map, you can see that the style of the graphic actually changes. And you can do that based on the graphic preferences. So if you want more smooth areas or more rounded fog of war systems, you can do that. And if you want a more faster, simpler approach, you can simply downscale the texture for the fog war system. Because we are calculating the size and scale on this texture back to the RTS 3D world, we have no issues with having a different size for the texture. And actually, it's not possible even to match those two sizes because this is in pixels and the 3D world is based on meters. So the way that we do that is by using the ratio to scale the texture back and forth. So as you can see, that is what it looks like. So now let me go back to code. So I like having 108. You can also increase this past uh, the amounts, but I don't think it's worth it. You can keep this pretty much downscaled. When you apply filters to the texture, this pretty much gets moved out. So on my world initialize nodes here, there's something important that actually happens here related to the fog of war. I have a function that initializes the fog of war for every single object in my world dynamic tree node. So this is a continuation from previous tutorials. On the region side of things, I talked about this. So basically what I'm doing here on the fog of war initializing the on starting the object 3D fog of war system, I'm going to say that if our object belongs to the player one, I'm going to skip this process entirely. So I only want units that belongs to the player one. We can change this based on diplomacy and other type of event for your game. This is how I'm doing. So I'm generating new sprites here to be added back to the three nodes of the fog of war controller here. So they're going to be displayed inside the viewport on, on this node right there. So that's, that is basically what I'm doing here and creating the new sprites is going to do that. So these sprites are going to be used to follow the units and because they are inside the viewport, once when we export it, we're going to use that to dissolve the image later. 
So that is how we are doing that. So we are creating that. I'm setting the texture to be a preloaded value right there that I'm using for this thing here. Then later I'm going to be adding that back to the inside the controller and I'm going to assign a reference back to the object 3D so we can later delete it or do something else with it. The size here doesn't matter which size you want, the only thing that matters is for you to scale that to the world to FLV scale ratio. So this is a variable inside my RTS map world because I'm going to be using this to calculate the unit's position and also the texture size. So that is pretty much important for me right there. So this is how I initialize the fog of war for all our 3D objects. So you can see right there that I'm setting the size, which is basically the size that I have assigned inside of the object divided by the size of that sprite. So I can keep getting a constant value. And later I'm going to set the scale for that size as I wanted right there. So that is pretty much how you initialize the fog of war for the objects. So whenever my RTS 3D world object on the game gets a tick, which is basically something that is going to happen, I'm going to run this function here, world time ticker, and I'm going to process my dynamic objects. So in the case of the fog of war update, I want to first see if the object has a FOV size. So basically if we we want that object to be active under our fog of war system to dissolve objects. I'm going to be checking if it's this size is higher than zero and if that is the case. I'm going to be updating the global position of the sprite node here, as you can see, based on the 3D object global position. And that vector two converted from the vector three, which is X and Z, is going to be multiplied on our scale ratio. So this is the part that we want to multiply the coordinate system from our units back to the world to FOV ratio. So we are going to want to match the position of the objects with the 3D world and the texture. So that is the way we do it. And if that's not the case, if our object doesn't even have a FOV size, I'm simply going to hide that sprite. So I update the grid position for the objects here, which is part of the previous tutorial. And here we ask after we have updated the fog of war object sprite, we want to re-render again the texture. So that is how we are doing it. That is going to access our FOV texture and is going to request a texture update. So now we should be talking about how we are processing the visibility of the objects. So whenever we are updating our objects here, so to update the fog of war for objects, I have a special function here, which I call it with a connection signal. So this is something I also needed to talk about. After we have created and built our fog of war, we want to update the fog of war finalized signal back to a new function. And this is a Lambda function, which basically means we are creating a function here to be connected to that signal. And the first thing we want is to save the texture. So I have here a fog of our texture that I want to be saving it. And whenever that signal gets called, so whenever we initialize the fog of our system, I want to update that by setting the shader texture to that texture. So this is the part where we access the shader for the terrain mesh to update its fog of our texture. So if I go back here to one of my mesh pieces and go to the material, you can see here on the code of the material that it has some textures to be used. And this is a blended terrain texture, which I did some tutorials about. But the important part here is the source texture FLV, which is going to be basically the texture we're going to assign for the fog of war. So I believe I have an example here. You can see if we drag this texture here on top of the source texture, you can see what it looks like. So this is what is going to happen when the fog of our texture is going to get assigned here. And we assign that whenever we update the fog of our from that controller node, which is this guy here. So that is how we are updating it. So we are accessing its shader and setting its source texture parameter to that texture we get from the fog of our viewport texture. 
this is the point where I update my sprites for our, for me to see on the screen on the corner there. And also for every unit inside the object dynamic list, I'm going to be updating that. And I'm going to be also passing a parameter to being a unit. And for whenever we want to update buildings, I also passing that through another dynamic list here, which is going to be our static objects list. So for buildings, I'm separating that into another variable there. So that is how we do it. So that is what's happening when the fog of war gets updated. We are executing all of this code whenever the updates it's called. So the signal comes from the fog of war texture, which emits the fog of war updated after everything here has been rendered. And once the signal gets emitted, we got that connected back to this function and it's going to update our, our, our objects and our textures. So this function here that updates our objects is whenever I want to control the visibility of the objects. So first things is I'm going to grab the coordinates in 2D from that 3D object and I'm going to that pass that through the map of set to center. So the origin of our map is the center and not top down. Otherwise this function is, going, is not going to work. So the coordinates have to add the offsets to the map. So now we have to match the coordinate system from the map to our 3D objects. So I have that to the map of set to center, which I basically set this whenever I set a new map size, which is basically half the map size. So in our function here that updates our 3D objects with the fog of war, I'm going to be creating a new variable called pixel color. And here, this is the part where we are going to detect whether or not to display units by uh, analyzing the pixel color from the fog of war. So as you can see here, we have an object type argument for this function and it's an integer. And we want different approaches towards units or buildings. So in the case of a building, important to notice that the variable is outside of the match. So we can use that on other functions down there. So the fog of war, if it's an unit, we're going to simply get the pixel color value from that color by getting from its coordinates multiplied by the ratio for the world to the fog of war texture. That is how you're going to get the pixel color from the fog of war texture image. So that's going to basically access the coordinate position from that unit and grab it, its color from the fog of war texture. In the case of buildings, that is different because if it's a building, we want to check that for every corner of the AABB. And we do that by grabbing the object 3D as a mesh instance to generate the AABB. And we also want to grab its global position because the AABB is a local coordinate system, it's not a global. So we need to pass that here because we want to be checking if that corner of the building is visible inside the fog of war. So for the fog of war, we want that. So for buildings, we want to calculate that not through its center, but rather for its corners. So that is why we're generating a four base points array here for vector three. So we can use that later. This is just some debug points that I'm going to be using to see the corners of the building, which is these sprites here. And this is the part where we decide if the corner of the building is visible or not. So for every single corner points inside those points. So for every corner of the building in the 3D space, we want to convert that to a 2D position top down, which is basically the A, B, X, Z plus the map offset to center. So this is how we're going to get the coordinate systems. And we want to grab its color from that corner point, which is basically that coordinate multiplied by texture ratio scale. And if we find a pixel corner that is higher than 0.5, we can break out of this loop because we know that now we have a pixel color that is visible for us. So the building can be displayed. So these are the code that happens for object type. So after this match statement has been finished, we're going to process the pixel color fetched from the fog of war texture. So on the first case here, if the pixel color is higher than 0.5, we know that this is fully visible. So in the case of the units being inside this white portion area here, that it has its color value higher than 0.5, we know we want to first display the objects. So this is a mandatory for every single object. We want to pop them under the screen. 
But if this is a building, we also want to change a couple of things. We want to basically set its shader color to grab it from the fog of our texture. But here there is a, a little complication because the fog of our texture goes for, from fully black to fully white. We do not want the buildings to have a fully black texture. So that is why I'm using a clamp function here to clamp the pixel color value to dim gray to fully white. So we don't get the fully black approach texture. So the way that looks inside the shader is as it follows. I'm going to grab the building that I'm using, which is a simple square mesh here inside my static list. And you can see the building right there. So on the shader color here, you can see we have a fog of our color, which is an instance uniform. So I can change the color for every single object in different ways. So this is going to be used to determine where the object is a building is fully visible or whether it's fully hidden. And whenever it's fully hidden, we want to basically disable its visibility. But if the player explores it and move the units outside, we want to keep the building semi-explored. So I want to have like a dim gray approach to it. So it looks like that. So this inside the game will look like this. So let me just run the game to show you what that looks like in real time. And of course my debug now that it's been returned, I need to set the scale back. So for the debug sprite that I'm using on the corner there, I'm going to set the scale back to what it was. So as you can see here, there's a building here which is that gray square. And every single corner of, of, of its AABB is going to be checked to know if the building is visible or not. So once this color here is higher than 0.5 on these four corners here, there's another point right there. It's going to first display the building as you see here. So after it has been displayed, we do not want to hide buildings whenever we get outside of the view. We want to grab the color from its center to use as a modulation for the shader. So this is what it looks like whenever units get closer to it. So let me just put my squadron back here. So whenever the fog of war gets close to the building center, we're going to modulate it black to we're going to modulate it back to fully white, and that is what it looks like. That is what it looks like. And whenever our units move outside, you're going to see that the building is going to get dimmer. But it's not going to reach fully black as the fog of war texture is here. And that is because we are doing that clamp value there back on the code. So this is what it looks like. So this is the behavior that I wanted for buildings. I want to dim them when they are whether they are not invisible. And we can replace this with dummy object mesh to get a simplified version of the building so we can hold more performance. So that is what it looks like with buildings. Whenever we reach a corner, we display it and we later calculate its color from the center so it's visible or not. Now regarding displaying units, because we are only calculating through the center of the units, it's more easier to do that. So with units, we are only calculated from its center. So let me move my units down here. So with units, we are not want to calculate anything else. We just need to calculate the coordinate system from their middle position. So as you can see, that was what it looks like. Whenever their pixel color for these objects is higher than 0.5, we want to display them. So we basically pop them under the screen. And whenever we move outside, because their pixel color gets less than 0.5, we simply hide them. So with units, it's a lot simpler to work with. So on the code here, this is what it looks like. So if our pixel color is higher than 0.5, we display it. If it's a building, we get, grab its color from its center. So it's center coordinates and we clamp that to not get fully black. And we assign that back as a mesh instance parameter back to its shader on its fog of our color. So in the case of the pixel color is not higher than 0.5, we know that it's hidden. Now it could be partially visible or it could be fully hidden. So in the case of the object being a building, we want to simply set its shader fog of our color to back to dim gray. And we do not want to hide it. But if it's not a building type, we can basically hide the object, which is gets applied to objects. It gets fully hidden. So this is the code that is being called for every single object in the game. Whenever the fog of our texture gets updated, 
Whenever the RTS map world calls for the fog of war to be updated after it executes a fic, and the fog of war texture gets updated, it's going to emit that signal, which it will connect back to reprocess all the objects and to save the textures and to apply the texture back to the RTS map world. So this is a pretty big workflow here that's happening. And that is what it looks like on the final result. So as you can see, that is how you can apply Fog of War without using physics. This is the way that I found to do it. You can also use distance calculations, but you have to be calculating for a couple of frames if the objects are inside or outside their Fog of War size. So I chose to do it with color because this reduces the iteration through units. So I think that by using the pixel color to decide whether or not to display units is a little bit faster because you don't have to be checking against other units. But we are going to be needing to do that anyway because we're going to be doing combat with units. So this is what I'm doing here on the physics process stuff for future videos. So that's all for the fog of war texture. So hopefully you were able to understand what I'm doing here. Hopefully that was not too complex. So that is all I have for you guys today. Hopefully you enjoy it and I'll see you on the next video.